you move further from Earth and see numerous satellites circling the planet. They come in all shapes and sizes, but each one of them has an antenna and a power source, often a solar panel or battery. You reach the moon. It's a cold and dry egg-shaped sphere, with the surface strewn with craters and rocks. You see dark areas. They appeared when giant hollows left by asteroids or comets got flooded by basaltic lava. Lighter areas are highlands. The next side on your way is Mars, which is called the Red Planet for a reason. It's covered with fine orange-red dust that looks like talcum powder. The planet's surface is rocky, with canyons, volcanoes, craters, and dry lake beds all over it. You spot a moving dust storm. It looks like a massive tornado. But that's a relatively small one. A large storm can be seen from Earth. You travel by gas giant Jupiter. The planet is covered in thick clouds – red, yellow, brown, and white. This makes Jupiter look as if it has stripes. The planet doesn't have a solid surface you could stand on, it's just layers and layers of gases. You immediately recognize Saturn thanks to its prominent rings. They consist of groups of tiny ringlets made of chunks of rock and ice. The planet itself is pretty much a ball of hydrogen and helium with no solid ground. Saturn is also the place where winds travel at a breakneck speed of 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. You don't come across any other planets on your way, they must be hiding behind the sun at the moment. Soon, you enter an eerie place. It's huge, cold, and dark. The Kuiper Belt is one of the biggest structures in our solar system. It looks like a donut, with its inner edges starting at about 30 astronomical units from the sun. And 1 AU is roughly the distance between our Sun and Earth, about 93 million miles. The Kuiper Belt is the main source of comets. Hundreds of thousands of objects in this area are 60 miles across and larger. Some of them even have their own moons. Well past the Kuiper Belt, you move through the Oort Cloud. It's a huge spherical shell surrounding the solar system and stretching for 5 to 100,000 astronomical units. You can compare the Oort cloud with a thick-walled bubble made up of more than 2 trillion icy pieces of space debris. The smallest of these space bodies are as big as mountains. You're leaving the solar system behind and are now moving through the vacuum between different star systems. But this vacuum isn't entirely empty. It's filled with dust and other particles, magnetic fields, and cosmic rays. Finally, you reach your destination – the black hole. It's a mysterious place where the laws of physics people are familiar with stop working. Black holes appear when massive stars collapse under their own weight. The gravitational field of the newly formed object is so powerful that even light, including X-rays, can't escape it. That's why the center of the black hole is pitch black. It doesn't mean you can't see the hole. The greedy thing consumes all the matter that strays too close, squeezing it into a superheated disk of glowing gas. The black hole also bends light around it, which creates a circular shadow. You approach this chaos of heat and gravity in search of the event horizon. Every black hole has an invisible line in the sand. Cross it, and you won't be able to escape, even if you're a beam of light. Beyond the point of no return, the gravity is just too strong. But the big circle in the middle is bigger than the event horizon. Anything that approaches the black hole first goes into orbit around it. Once that happens, there's no way back. Whatever this object is, it'll end up being pulled into the hole. This region before the event horizon, called the photon sphere, looks like the black hole's shadow, even though it isn't. If you got there and somehow managed to stay in one piece, you'd be able to see the back of your head. Hmm. The particles of light from your head would orbit around the black hole at immense speeds and come at you from ahead. Unfortunately, you wouldn't manage to pull it off. Once you started your journey towards the center of the black hole, the difference in acceleration between your head and feet would be many thousands of Earth gravities. You would be spaghettified, but <laughs> you'll find out about that later. Right now, you're watching in awe how unlucky adventurers surrender to the black hole's gravity and begin their journey toward the end. First, the material gets caught in the black hole's orbit and squeezed into a razor-thin spinning band. Friction, heat, electric, and magnetic forces energize this disk, which makes the material glow intensely. The most massive black holes have such bright bands that they can outshine millions of galaxies. 
Inside this disk of glowing material, particles rub against one another. It slows them down and sends them straight toward the black hole's event horizon. If this friction didn't exist, the material would be orbiting the black hole for billions of years, like planets circle around their stars. Anyway, you eventually reach the so-called surface of the black hole. By that I mean the event horizon. It's not a real boundary or membrane, and you don't understand you've crossed it right away. It takes you several seconds to realize you won't be able to escape the black hole's clutches anymore. It's not as dark as you imagined it would be. That's because the light, also trapped by the black hole's gravitational pull, is falling in along with you. It's not bright, but it's still there. The longer you fall, the more stretched head-to-toe you become. This process is what's called spaghettification. You also get squeezed around your midsection, and the beams of light surrounding you form a glowing band around your waist. The last thing you see is darkness. It feels as if you're landing on a massive, empty, pitch-black planet. You're flying above Earth on the International Space Station at an altitude of 250 miles. You cast a glance out the porthole, and your eyes widen in surprise. There's some kind of bright blue flash just above nighttime Europe. It's like there was an explosion of some strange substance there. Such a strange luminous event was spotted by a French astronaut from aboard the ISS. And it wasn't an explosion at all. It was lightning and was directed upwards. Until recently, this phenomenon was a kind of fairy tale among pilots. Scientists had heard their stories about lightning striking upward and about red and blue flashes at high altitudes too. But there was no definitive proof of the existence of these luminous events. But they do exist and are called sprites, elves, trolls, and ghosts. So how does ordinary lightning work? Masses of moist air in a cloud rub against each other and create static electricity. It would be almost the same if you danced in a wool sweater. It becomes charged with static electricity. And if you touch a metal doorknob, there's a discharge between your fingers and the door. There's your lightning. So a thundercloud builds up a strong negative charge. Sooner or later, a leader is born in the cloud. It's a bright thermo-ionized channel, or more simply, lightning. The leader moves toward the ground in steps of a few tens of feet. And it can accelerate to an average speed of 200,000 miles per hour. At that speed, you could make a trip around the Earth in just seven minutes. But negative particles attract positive particles, and particles with opposite charges will tend to connect and compensate for each other. So, simultaneously with the negatively charged leader, the positive charge from the Earth begins its upward journey. The electric charge from the Earth connects with the negatively charged leader in one channel. This is when the brightest and loudest discharge happens. We call it lightning. It's this discharge that you hear as thunder. The main lightning doesn't strike from top to bottom, but from bottom to top. Yep, that is, the lightning is actually directed upward. It's as if the Earth is striking back at the thundercloud. And that charge can reach up to 30,000 amps. Your average wall outlet only has about 15 amps. And the record for the length of lightning is about 440 miles. That's more than the width of the state of Kansas. Meteorologists recorded such lightning in Brazil. It was a discharge between giant thunderclouds. And the longest lightning strike was recorded in Argentina. A single lightning strike there lasted 16.3 seconds. By comparison, you blink at 0.1 seconds. So we saw a regular lightning strike. The positive particles from the ground neutralized the negative particles in the cloud. But the cloud is still full of positively charged particles. They accumulate and wait for their time to create lightning. Once the charge reaches a critical point, the lightning cloud throws that charge dozens of miles upward. This is called a blue jet. It's exactly the same luminous event seen by a French astronaut aboard the International Space Station. The blue jets look like someone turned on a gas burner pointing upward. The positively charged blue jets neutralize at high altitudes with negatively charged particles. But people on the ground cannot observe blue jets. Thunderclouds obstruct the view but they can be seen from an airplane. That's why, for a long time, commercial airline pilots were the only witnesses to this phenomenon. On board the ISS is also a great place to observe jets, as they are born at the very top of thick clouds and shoot dozens of miles upwards. But if you climb even higher, you can see this kind of bizarre lightning. It's a sprite. It looks more like a jellyfish. 
a cloud of red charge at the top, and a bunch of little tentacles coming down. Now, normal lightning can have a temperature of about 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but you can touch a sprite with your hands. Unless, of course, you're afraid of a powerful electrical discharge. The sprite has about the same temperature as an energy-saving light bulb. All because sprites are born in the mesosphere. This is the layer of our atmosphere that starts at about 31 miles high. And it's the coldest place on our planet. On the ground level, where we live, the air is much denser. There are just more air molecules. They absorb heat from the sun's rays, and we feel comfortable. But the higher up we go, the fewer air molecules there are. At the altitude at which commercial airline planes fly, there's no longer enough air to accumulate that heat. You wouldn't even be able to breathe up there. That's why every airplane has oxygen masks for emergencies. And the temperature here is even colder than at the South Pole. In the mesosphere, there's almost no air, and the temperature here can be around negative 202 degrees Fahrenheit. And although the temperature of the lightning itself is high, in general, it's like if you poured a glass of boiling water into a huge barrel of cold water. The temperature won't change much. Sprites can only appear when paired with thunderclouds below. As a discharge occurs in a cloud, a sprite appears in the mesosphere. It tries to equalize the amount of charge in the atmosphere. So it's like these red flashes of lightning are trying to reach down to the thunderstorm. And a sprite itself can be as wide as the state of Massachusetts. And then there's a ghost. It can appear for the tiniest fraction of a second right after the sprite. It's a faint green glow, like an aurora. They were first discovered in 2014, and official confirmation by the scientific community only appeared in 2019. They're still poorly understood, but there's a hypothesis that ghosts have something in common with auroras. At least their color is green, and it may arise due to excited oxygen atoms. Sometimes we can spot trolls along with sprites. They look like pillars that support a sprite. It's a red glow at the end of the sprite's tentacles. The next moment, the troll releases a red streak down from itself. You're hovering about 18 miles above the yeah. surface of Earth and enjoying the best view of our planet. Whoa, <gasps> that's a starfall. Make a wish. And that bright dot that's moving very fast is the International Space Station. And then the waiter brings you a drink. Wait, mm -hmm. why is there a waiter? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, you're on a tourist spaceship. And very soon, everyone will be able to fly into space with giant balloons. This is Neptune. It's a round capsule with panoramic windows and a 360-degree view. It can take on board nine people in comfortable seats, including eight passengers and one pilot. It also has an under-deck toilet. As the manufacturers say, it's the toilet with the best oh. view in the universe. There's also a luggage compartment for tools and scientific equipment in the roof of the capsule, a Wi-Fi connection that will even allow live streaming, and there's a bar with refreshments. Mm -hmm. Space Perspective, the creators of Neptune's plan to price passenger tickets starting at $150,000. And there's no rocket engines, are there? This thing will go up thanks to a giant balloon the size of a football field. Let's move to the launch pad. Passengers enter the capsule. Engineers fill the balloon with hydrogen. It's lighter than air, so the balloon begins to take off. When the thrust becomes sufficient, the capsule with the passengers takes off from the launch pad. The journey begins. The capsule and balloon go up at 12 miles per hour. That's twice as slow as a person can run, and 2,000 times slower than a conventional rocket takes off. So you won't experience hard overloads, vibration, and noise like you would on a conventional rocket. So you're already at 45,000 feet. It's almost halfway there. This is where commercial airplanes fly. This is the frontier where the weather ceases to exist. No clouds, no wind currents or turbulence, but no oxygen either. You'd need an oxygen tank to breathe here, but the Neptune capsule is airtight, so you keep climbing. You also notice that the balloon has grown up several times. This is because we filled the balloon with hydrogen at zero altitude. The hydrogen was putting pressure on the balloon from the inside, but the air from the atmosphere was putting pressure on the balloon from the outside. But the higher up you go, the less air there is. Hydrogen continues to pressurize the balloon from the inside, but now nothing is stopping it from expanding. So we need a very dense material that can stretch for the balloon. Humanity launches such balloons with weather probes all the time. They take off and get bigger as they ascend. 
But at extreme altitudes, the balloon material can't withstand the pressure, and it pops. The weather probe falls to the ground. We don't want the capsule with people to fall, so Neptune won't take off that high. But in case of emergency, Neptune has a parachute for safe landing. It's already deployed, and it's attached to the rope that goes to the balloon. So in case of unforeseen events, the parachute will instantly open, and the capsule will begin its slow descent. The entire takeoff procedure lasts two hours, and you reach the 100,000 feet mark. In human history, only about 20 people went to the stratosphere by balloon. The capsule hangs in the air. Now you and all the passengers have two hours to admire the curvature of the Earth, take endless selfies, and relax. You can even see a blue stripe over the surface of the planet. That's our atmosphere. And if you look up, you can see the most beautiful starry sky of your life. Because there are no clouds or light pollution from the big cities at this altitude, and you can see the stars in all their glory. For the same reason, we send our telescopes to this altitude. Two hours have passed. It's time for the descent. This procedure is slow and gentle too. The balloon is lowered. Atmospheric pressure begins to press on it again, and it shrinks in size. The capsule will land on the water. It has a splashdown cone at the bottom for this purpose. This thing will help dampen the impact on the water so that everything happens softly and smoothly. Two more hours of descent have passed. The Neptune touches the water. Now a ship is approaching the capsule. It takes the passengers on board and takes them to the shore. It also takes the capsule itself on board for relaunch into the stratosphere. But the balloon itself can no longer be used for a new trip. As soon as the passengers touch the ground, their journey is over. The first person to ascend to the stratosphere in a balloon was this Swiss man, Auguste Picard. He designed this round gondola. It was airtight and could take two people on board. The gondola was attached to a huge balloon as big as a basketball court. As with Neptune, the balloon was filled with hydrogen. In May 1931, Auguste Picard and Paul Kipfer began their flight. As they gained altitude, they discovered several problems. The airtightness of the capsule was bad. Air would escape from the capsule, but they were able to fix the problem. They were climbing higher and it was getting colder outside, but the temperature inside the gondola reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit because the crew couldn't control the air release valve, so they felt like they were in a hot desert. Auguste's gondola reached an altitude of 51,775 feet, only 16,000 feet higher than commercial airplanes fly now. And 17.5 hours after launch, Auguste landed back on the ground. During this and other flights, the scientists collected a lot of data about the wind in these layers of the atmosphere and cosmic rays. He was also the first person to send a radio signal to Earth from such an altitude. Later, Auguste Picard used the idea of a fully airtight gondola to dive to extreme depths. He created a bathyscaphe, capable of descending to the deepest point on our planet, the Mariana Trench. Even though the Neptune is much more advanced, it still can't fly into space. The Earth has three main layers, two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle and then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought, because now scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon, and made of nickel and solid iron. It's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. 
they found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shockwaves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again, or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers, mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. There's been a lot of talk about black holes lately since Catherine Bowman figured out how to take a picture of one. After seeing the image, I realized I didn't actually know that much about them. So instead of working today, I went down my own black hole of watching a bunch of science videos, don't tell my boss, and I got this thought. What would happen if a black hole came into our solar system? So I did what most people do when some random question pops up in their brain. I took to the internet to find the answer. And oh boy, did I learn some things. Our solar system is made up of eight planets, hundreds of natural satellites like moons, thousands of asteroids, and billions of comets. 
This beautiful space cocktail is constantly moving around our sun, but it could all be torn apart if just one stray black hole decided to drop by. A black hole isn't likely going to disturb the peace of our planet anytime soon. And even though the closest black hole to our solar system is 10 to 13 times the mass of our sun, it's located 3,000 light years away. So we'd know way in advance if it ever decided to start moving closer. But let's pretend that some other black holes decided to take a shortcut through our solar system. First, I have a confession to make. Before I did all this research, I thought black holes were like just giant space holes. Turns out that they're actually huge amounts of matter crammed into a teeny tiny space. It'd be like squeezing the entire mass of our sun into Manhattan. As a result, they have an extremely strong gravitational pull. In fact, it's so powerful that even light can't escape once a hole gets its hands on it. I also thought that all black holes were basically the same. A big fat star collapses, then boom, black hole. Those ones are called stellar mass black holes, but there are also mega monsters called super massive black holes. Those ones can be found churning slowly at the centers of galaxies. They gather tremendous amounts of gas and stardust around them, making them expand to sizes our simple human minds would find unfathomable. Now, the chances of us getting close to a supermassive black hole are infinitesimal. But if our galaxy, the Milky Way, decided to rearrange itself, putting us a few dozen light years away from the center where a supermassive black hole lives, instead of 26,000 light years away, we'd be doomed. You see, all those planets, stars, comets, and space debris circling around the monster would come flying into our solar system, crashing into everything and making a big mess and whatever's left of our little family of planets would get swept up into the current of the gravitational pull and circle around the black hole until the end of time. But what about a stellar mass black hole? They may be way smaller than those monstrous supermassive black holes, but there's a lot more of them in the universe. They appear when stars run out of their star fuel and basically fall into themselves. This only happens if a star is big enough, like 3 to 10 times bigger than our sun. It'll keep compressing and compressing until, voila, a baby stellar mass black hole is born. Aww. It may be baby in size, but these puppies are still 20 times heavier than the sun. So let's say, unknown to us, a stellar mass black hole is nearing the outskirts of our solar system right now. First to feel its effects would be the Oort cloud, named after Dutch astronomer Jan Oort. This bubble of icy space debris that surrounds the outermost rim of our solar system 100,000 times further out than we are from the Sun will be popped by the gravitational pull of the black hole. As a result, ice-cold comets from this area get sent toward Earth and other planets of our solar system. And we keep living our lives like nothing is wrong. Here's the thing I find most terrifying. We wouldn't notice the black hole until it's too late. The only detail that could give away the approaching black hole is a slight blurring of distant stars due to the hole's gravitational lensing effect. The gravitational field of a black hole is so powerful, it actually bends light rays trying to pass it. We may miss that cue, but we'll definitely notice when the black hole starts pulling layers from the gas planets such as Neptune, Jupiter, or Saturn. It'll create such a huge, super hot cloud of dust and gas around itself that people of Earth couldn't help but notice. It seems unfair that something that small, the tiniest black holes can be only 15 miles in diameter, can consume things thousands of times bigger. But before it eats any of our solar system, it'll tear it all apart first. You see, our planets are held in orbit by our sun's gravity. As the gravitational pull of the black hole approaches each planet, it'll play tug-of-war with our sun, ripping them all to pieces. As soon as the black hole reaches the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars, we'll start to feel its pull. Super volcanoes will go off, devastating earthquakes will shake the ground, and everything will crumble into dust and debris Thanos-style. 
Also contrary to what I used to believe, black holes don't suck stuff in either. Suction can only be caused when something is getting pulled into the vacuum of space, and a black hole is the opposite of space. So don't worry, if we ever got close enough to one, we'd never get sucked in, we'd simply just fall in. Well, that's comforting to know. But it's not a drop kind of fall. Black holes like to make a show out of it. We travel back in time to 4.6 billion years ago to see the moment when our solar system was born. Wow, there's nothing that looks like a star or a planet. So far, there's just a giant cloud of dust. It's called a nebula. These are molecules of hydrogen in heavier elements, along with ice, left there from a previous star. But this cloud isn't dense, so it can't turn into a star or a planet. But then a blast wave comes here, maybe even several. There's a supernova explosion a couple of light years away from our nebula. This is when a giant star burns off its fuel, then collapses under its own weight. At this point, a boom of such force that its light can be seen dozens of light years away. The blast wave from a supernova reaches our nebula like a sea wave. It hits the dust cloud, causing it to shrink and become denser. Then the nebula gained a common center of gravity. It attracted more and more dust particles to itself. This put a lot of pressure on the nebula's core. It started spinning. And the greater the mass of the central cloud, the faster it rotated. The particles inside the core collided faster and more frequently. This raised the temperature of the nebula to several thousand degrees. At this point, a protostar appeared. It was a young and unstable sun. When the temperature in the nebula's core reached millions of degrees, nuclear reactions began there. The cores of light elements like hydrogen and helium hit each other and fused into heavier elements. Let there be light. 4.5 billion years ago, the protostar evolved into a stable sun, but 30% dimmer than we have it now. There's also a giant cloud of dust left behind. This is the remnant of material that didn't take part in the creation of our star. Now you can see the larger objects in this cloud. Heavy elements and dust began to pile up, forming protoplanets. At this stage of our solar system's existence, there were about 100 protoplanets, ranging in size from lunar to Martian. Back then, there was nothing but total chaos. These protoplanets didn't have clear orbits, and they began to collide with each other. Some crashed into a pile of debris, creating massive explosions. Others collided tangentially and simply changed their trajectory. In this cosmic billiards game, the largest protoplanets won. They literally ate the smaller debris and got bigger and bigger. The chaos didn't stop until about 100 million years later. You can see some nearly formed planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Our home planet now looks more like a lump of lava. The constant bombardment of the surface by various asteroids has heated the planet greatly, but now it has begun to cool down. Everything went quite well until an unknown villain appeared on the horizon. It's Taya. It's a hypothetical planet the size of Mars formed around the same time as the other planets. And now, it's spiraling toward Earth, ready to hit it. Bam! As a result of the impact, a huge chunk of our planet was knocked out into space. Taya herself was blown to pieces. Its core merged with the core of the Earth, while the rest of the material remained in our planet's orbit. Gradually, the debris from both planets began to collide with each other and merge into a large cosmic body. When the dust settled, the Earth received its satellite, the Moon. Another hypothesis for the formation of the Moon suggests that Taya was much larger than Earth. It only lightly scratched our planet and continued moving without losing its material. And the Moon was formed almost entirely from particles of our planet. As proof of this hypothesis, we have samples of lunar soil delivered by the astronauts of the Apollo mission. It turns out that the lunar soil is very similar in composition to Earth's crust, and it could only have gotten there as a result of some violent event. Gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune formed a little later and further from the Sun. These planets are literally balls of gas. There's no solid surface. If you step on Jupiter, you'll fall until you reach its core. These guys couldn't get a solid surface for several reasons. 
They formed later, when other planets took over the metals in silicates. They also all originated beyond the frost line. This is a hypothetical point somewhere beyond the orbit of Mars. The Sun doesn't heat the area behind this line enough for water to be in a liquid state. So there was a tremendous amount of ice in the remaining clouds of gas. Three million years after the birth of the Sun, these building materials started to pile up and build mass, becoming proto-Jupiter. Within a couple of million years, this ball of ice could reach a mass about 50 times larger than Earth. And the heavier it got, the more gas from the disk it was able to accumulate. In a short period of time, Jupiter absorbed almost all the material from the disk of gas near it and accumulated about 318 Earth masses. Jupiter had a very strong gravitational field, and it wreaked havoc on all objects in the area between Mars and Jupiter. Protoplanets collided there much more often, causing them to collapse. As a result, we have the asteroid belt. These are fragments unable to reassemble into a full planet because of the intense gravity of the gas giant. Saturn, the next of the four gas giants, it's three times smaller than Jupiter. It's thought to be so small because it's even farther from the Sun, about 10 Earth-Sun distances. And it began its formation even later when Jupiter left almost nothing of the gas disk. But Saturn got another distinguishing feature, the rings. They're so wide that you could fit 21 Earth planets on them, and they're as thick as a five-story building. We still don't know how they were formed, but there's two main hypotheses. So Saturn has 82 moons discovered so far. There may have been one more, but it was destroyed in a wild collision. The moon was shattered into small fragments that began to orbit the gas giant. These fragments, in turn, collided with each other and shattered again. Gradually, debris the size of a skyscraper turned into small grains of sand. Yep, Saturn's rings are made up of cosmic dust and ice.